Okay, so I just welcome the new people that have just come in. Just uh, we're going to give it a couple more minutes for some people to join us, and then we'll start the event. Just to let you all know as well that the recording has started. So if any of you are unhappy about your camera or microphone being on, then this is just your chance to turn it off now. Um, so yeah, it's being all recorded. I'm going to try and stop swiveling around in my chair because otherwise you see me going around, don't you? <laughs> Okay, should we start? Should we go? Perfect. So welcome everybody to our National Theatre Connections event. And thank you so much to the wonderful playwrights for joining us. Oh, hang on, I've got an echo. Can you hear? If I, is it just me or is it you? Can you hear an echo on me? Just me. That's fine. That's fine. I will deal with that. Um, I'm Sarah. I'm from Meta and Drama. I've also got with me Kirsten Adam, who is the Connections producer, and we're going to be running this together. So I'm just going to do a few housekeeping points just quickly. Um, it's all online. We all know that kids might run in. We might get technical issues. Um, so just bear with us. And hopefully this will run for around an hour, I'd say. Um, we're going to have hear from all of the wonderful playwrights about their plays, about their inspirations. We've had a few questions in from teachers already. So we'll ask those at the end. Um, and then the session will be recorded, like I said. So if you're happy, um, come on on the end, ask your question, ask away. Um, and then we'll finish up at the end. So I'm going to hand over to you. Kirsten now to introduce what National Theatre Connections is all about and then we'll hear from the playwrights themselves. Sarah and thanks so much yeah for setting this up it's really great to be celebrating the anthology so um hi everyone my name is Kirsten I am the Connections producer at the National Theatre um, and for those of you who um don't know Connections it's the National's Nationwide Youth Theatre Festival so every year we commission playwrights to write new plays specifically for young performers which are then performed by schools and youth theatres all over the UK um, and groups have the opportunity to perform them at, at their school or at their venue and then also to take part in a partner theatre festival so we have a network of around um, 30 partner theatres all over the country who host festivals which are a real celebration of um, of young people of youth theatre and of new writing um, and a great opportunity for the young people involved to see each other's work and um, kind of feel part of something bigger than themselves um, and absolutely at the core of connections are the plays um, and one of the reasons connections was uh, started was because there weren't there wasn't a kind of canon of plays for young performers um, and a brilliant thing about the anthology which has now you know been published for a number of years is it now has this fantastic resource of uh, lots of amazing plays uh, for young people to perform um, that come along with kind of uh, workshop ideas and lesson plans and um, things that kind of support the uh, groups to keep producing them and keep putting these plays on which is fantastic um, so I'm now going to pass over to uh, our brilliant writers uh, to tell you a bit about um, their connections plays and um, so I will first go to Frances if that's all right Oh, um, start with me. <laughs> Hi everyone, my name is Frances Poet. Um, my connections play is called Crusaders, um, and the premise of Crusaders, um, it sounds a bit uh, sort of out there to say it, but the idea is that um, people, all, young people all over the world, have um, been visited by a vision on the same night, um, and they all interpret it as coming from. Uh, whatever their culture is, their God, their own subconscious. And they all um, go on a journey and they uh, bring with them this sort of force of um, of young people uh, to meet together at this point on a mountain. So the play um, is quite um, sort of in its scale. It, it kind of, we jump from uh, the, the 
horrific Texan cages where um, uh, refugee children were separated from the parents. We jumped from them to um, uh, young Israeli and Palestinian kids um, in the Gaza Strip to um, an Indian um, child bride. But at the at the center of it all, we have and we start with these young um, young people in an Edinburgh school about to take their uh, French um, uh, speaking exam and um, and the the least charismatic, the least likely kid among them is the one who's had a dream and he has to somehow uh, get them all to walk away from their exam and come with him on this journey. So it all takes place over a week and over that week we, um, we sort of experience different people, d- the kids on this different journey. Um, and, and the... The inspiration for the play um, came from two different places, really. One, which was a friend of mine um, mentioned about the children's crusade um, that I'd never heard of. So in a, along with all the medieval crusades, there was an unofficial crusade where two children, uh, 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 two young boys, one from France and one from Germany, both independently experienced a vision from God and managed to get groups of, um, a, you know, a crusade's worth of, um, of young people to follow them. The the French lad, it sort of petered out into nothing. The, the German lad um, had sort of quite a traumatic end where half of them died on a shipwreck and the other half were sold into slavery. So um, I've kind of stolen bits of that for my play. Um, but actually, um, when I heard about that was not long after the Stoneman Douglas shooting in America in early 2018 and there was this there were these incredible young people um uh, Emma Gonzalez who I think now is ex Gonzalez and and David Hogg and they they started this never again movement and I felt really hopeful and it was this moment where I felt that young people might um might actually save us all. Um, and that sort of very much channeled into the play. Um, now I feel a bit guilty that um, that I decided that the young people should do it when really we all need to do it. But um, that was kind of the, one of the big ideas in it. And the third thing I think I'm supposed to tell you in my introduction is, um, is the experience of having watched um, young people do it. So the um, Sadly, because of the pandemic, I didn't get to see it performed live. I've seen um, a few um, streamed productions. Uh, one, a video production of um, Pace um, in Paisley, which is I live in Glasgow, and it's just um, down the road from us. And it was an extraordinary production. That, you know, it's sort of uniformly strong ensemble, massively invented production, slick um, you know, beautiful production values as well, which um, is sort of surprising uh, for, for for that sort of group. But it, but that was really inspiring. But j- just one thing to say about young people performing is I was um, the national facilitated a workshop in an Edinburgh school, um, and that was an extraordinary. You know, my early development of the play, I got to take the idea to these young people, hear their feedback. Um, got them to improv different scenes, wrote it off the back of that, then was able to go back, hear them read it, hear their ideas about it. So that was an incredible um, sort of development experience for the play. So I got to uh, really have that sort of input from the young people as I was writing it. Oh, and now I have to pass over to the next person, I think. So you'll all, whoever I choose will hate me. I'm going to choose Silva because she's at the top of my screen. Thanks, Francis. Um, hello, I'm Sylvia Mercy, and it's going to be less off the cuff. That was really impressive, Francis. Um, so I prepared something. Um, my play is called Witches Can't Be Burned. Witches Can't Be Burned is about a group of student actors who are cast in Arthur Miller's The Crucible for a play competition, but find that they dislike the representation of the female characters, and so decide to mount an alternative version of the play. Um, I was inspired to write the play after seeing a production of The Crucible, and it was a situation which I was suddenly struck by how the females came across, the female characters came across. Um, When I first encountered the play as a university student, I hadn't noticed this dimension at all. And I think that was because I knew it was considered a masterpiece, and so I was interacting with it in this sort of premise of, I shall just absorb what is great about this. but now, but in this particular setting where I saw it again as a much older person, I now noticed the, the way that the women and girls were represented. And it seemed that they were, um, the, the, the way they were written seemed to be re- reproducing and reinforcing 
overfamiliar and unflattering stereotypes. For example, the evil temptress, the witch, the mean girl. Um, and mean girls became kind of my motto in my head as I was writing because I, I started to see it everywhere and everything I was watching on Netflix and elsewhere, that this, this stereotype was very prevalent. Um, and this, this now glared out to me as uh, outdated and unfair. So I thought, um, because this is a play that's frequently performed by youth theater groups for the numerous roles it has for young performers, The Crucible, I wonder what that experience was like for those young performers, because youth theater, um, as we all know, is meant to reinforce, uh, to, to promote feelings of confidence, um, other good outcomes. But I thought perhaps that this in this particular kind of um, what this had on, I was thinking maybe it was producing alternative outcomes or something opposite. Um, and so um, I and I even reinforced this by surfing some YouTube offerings of high school productions of The Crucible, where I saw effectively teenage boys shouting down teenage girls with sexist slurs time and again, because those are prevalent, those are a part of the play. So I really wondered, um, what is the value of a, um, a masterpiece or purpose of a masterpiece to this generation or this particular masterpiece, but what in general is purpose of a masterpiece? In, um, in contemporary life and to those that are experiencing it now, to what degree do young actors um, have some say in how they are represented and how they can interact with it? And should they be asked to serve a masterpiece? Um, that's a, a line that kind of recurs in the play, my play. So um, I thought of a group of young performers having the same realization as I had and deciding to push back. And um, with regard to productions, I've not been able to see very many either. Um, they've been online, but uh, I think the ones that I've seen, you get a certain sense of the flow in between different kind of postings on YouTube or whatever, and the things that work best seem to be aware of the energy for mine has a, quite a lot of dialogue in it. And so keeping the momentum flowing and ensuring that um, that it does come across as banter rather than um, the kind of measured one statement of one character and, um, and allowing swift transitions between the numerous scenes, because there's quite a few scenes in it. Um, and... Um, and to enjoy the theatrical stage, like the, the possibilities of there's an opening scene which sort of tries to um, evoke the crucible itself and um, to really enjoy those and, and think of some bold ideas for how those could be staged to contrast with the rest of the plays in kind of the realistic setting of a school preparing for the um, for what's called play fest within my play. So that's my play. And um, I will hand over. Oh, I have to look the names up. Alison, please. Hello, hello everyone. Um, my name is Alison Carr and I wrote the play uh, Tuesday. Uh, so Tuesday is a play that asks what if there are parallel worlds bouncing around out there in the universe and what might happen if two of those parallel worlds collided. Um, so it's a regular Tuesday at uh, Lane End School and then suddenly a tear opens in the sky over the yard, um, a tear between two universes. So people fall in and people are pulled out and we've got a character who meets her double, but they've made very different choices in their lives so far. Uh, we've got a character who gets to have one more day with his uh, dead sister and we've got a character who has a chance at a new start and there's, there's some more threads in there as well. Um, and with the play, I wanted to write something that was a bit fantastical and that was a bit sci-fi and that was fun and that was quite playful, but that doesn't shy away from sort of bigger topics, um, especially at this core of it. It's got this idea of us and them. Um, in terms of inspiration and what it was that I wanted to do with the play, uh, in all of my writing, I'm quite drawn to the odd or the other, um, the extreme sort of crashing into the everyday. I've never written anything quite as overtly sci-fi as Tuesday, but you know, I grew up watching Star Trek and the X-Files, so I thought this was my chance, you know, grab it while I could. Um, and Parallel Worlds is something that's always interested me as an idea, but it's something that I always thought that I would need a bigger cast for to tell that kind of story. And Connections is one of those rarer opportunities these days where you get to write for a, for a nice big cast. Um, so with that, I wanted to write something that was as open to as many young people being involved as possible. So there's a small core cast of nine uh, named characters who have the more substantial sort of speaking roles, but then there can be as big of an ensemble as, as the groups want there to be 
there can be some performers who've got lines and some performers who don't, but they can be part of the bigger like movement sections. So I wanted it to be as flexible as possible to accommodate as many people who wanted to take part as possible and that people could take part in in lots of different ways. Um, yeah, I think, well, I didn't want to, another thing when I was writing it, I didn't want to talk down to the young people that I was writing for or patronise them. I think that was my big terror um, that I'd come across as this sort of adult trying to be down with the kids. Um, I wanted to talk, I want to talk about like big topics. Um, you know, there's, there's bereavement in there. There's a character with caring responsibilities. It talks about um, bullying from the perspective of a perpetrator and from a victim. Um, it talks about pressure and division and conflict and choices, you know, these big sort of ideas, but framing it all in this kind of sci-fi, like impossible in inverted commas, who knows if there are parallel worlds, uh, universe. And, you know, hopefully that's a way in for the young people to explore these big and, you know, hopefully interesting topics for them to, to think about. Um, and finally, my main aim was to write something that the groups and the young people can claim as their own and that can bring their own ideas to. You know, there's a structure and there's dialogue and there's a plot, but I wanted to have these big sections where, you know, all the script says is they fly into the sky or they make a human chain or, you know, these really major moments that the groups could find and make their own so that each group doing it could like really take ownership of it. In terms of productions that I've seen, um, like Francis and Silver have said, I, I haven't been able to see too many and I haven't seen any of them live on stage. Um, I saw one from a youth theatre in Prague who did it on Zoom and it was very inventive. Um, and I saw a couple of the productions that were streamed from the Traverse um, on YouTube. They were all very different, um, you know, to that point of me hoping that every group would embrace it and, and make it theirs. Um, obviously, there are limitations on, on Zoom, especially in a play where people are flying up and down out of the sky. I mean, there are limitations with that live on stage. Um, but, you know, there's the Prague group, like really, they really sort of utilised Zoom and the group that I saw on stage, they actually brought in some elements of their Zoom rehearsals into their live performance. So that um, it was really actually really inventive and and all of them I've seen have been really, really fluid. You know, there's no scene changes, there's no, um, there's no like props or anything and it all just flows really nicely, which is something that I've really enjoyed out of, of the ones that I've seen. Um, you know, like I wrote a play with these really big movement set pieces in it and then no one could be in a room together. So not great, but, um, you know, the groups that I've seen have, have really, really worked hard and been really, really inventive. Um, and I absolutely praise them for that. And, you know, any productions kind of going forward, once people can be in a room together, you know, who knows what might happen? I'll be excited to see it. Um, but yeah, that's my play. So I will pass on to Miriam. Hiya. Hi, can you hear me? Good. Um, everyone's spoken really elegantly, so I'm going to uh, lower the tone. Um, so I, at my play, Find a Partner, um, came from a conversation with my mother, um, where all great plays come from in my life. Um, I said to my mum that I was going to write a play for young people, for connections, and she said, can, can you not write one of your nasty plays? Can you write a nice play? Can you write a play about something nice like love? And I immediately was like, well, I don't think love's very nice. I think love's like the Hunger Games. And then, ha ha, an idea formed quickly. So um, I've always been quite perplexed by the human project of coupledom, as I like to call it. I find it quite bizarre. Um, and so, like particularly that we might choose our life partner like uh, literally our life our partner in life and all things financial and otherwise based on the fact that we fancy them i think that's like not a very sophisticated screening process um and so i've always been slightly confused anyway so all of this has been swimming around for an entire lifetime but um i decided that um i wanted to write about competitive coupling um because i i i think it's quite an accurate term for what I've witnessed. It's also not like, it's not that rogue a concept. Like if you watch reality television and or any television actually, 
that uh, coupling has been made into a kind of fantastically interesting sport um, with kind of like all kinds of arbitrary moralities, um, like just like put around feelings. And I just think it's fascinating. I'm like, endlessly, completely, chronically obsessed with Love Island, re like reviled by it and also like consuming it, like gorging on it, like 71 hours worth of it in the last two months only. And I, you know, and I'm just like fascinated with it. So I thought, Okay, I'm gonna. So what I've what I've created in my play Find a Partner is a it's a kind of a theatrical game where several contestants are trying to fall in love as quickly and as accurately as possible, um, and if they don't manage to find a partner, they will be um, killed. And so yeah, the stakes are pretty high. So I guess you you could say it's something like a theatrical Love Island meets the Hunger Games experience, um, and on threat of death at the end um but i wanted really to write something that i hope it just just heightens and raises the stakes on something that i genuinely think is very interesting and that everybody at some point in their life is going to um grapple with um and i really wanted to explore and make something i i feel like shows like for example love island do lend themselves very well to satire and comedy and i just think I just thought there was just like a very nice marrying of the two, but I, I really want it. I mean, I've done a lot of youth theatre in my, as a sort of as a facilitator in my life. And I have often found that some plays are very inflexible. So my, my big priority kind of like Alison actually like was to make something that's very flexible and that can kind of grow or shrink to whatever the group size is. So although there's some characters that I hope are really exciting and like, and I like really real, really well realized, I hope um, it's also, the play can like move out and you can have as many spectators as you need um, so that everybody can kind of be involved and have some good lines. My, my priority when writing for like larger groups and for young people is that everybody has a really great line. Like everybody has got to have a moment where the theatre is in their hand. And so I've like really tried with that. I really pushed it. Um, and, but yeah, I hope that the play, it might sound a bit um, daft, definitely but it is actually something that I think is really important and uh oh that sounds like so I can't believe I just said that it's so lame um <laughs> but yeah um, I've seen I haven't been able to see anything live sadly of course and of course I wrote this to be like a very physical uh play about intimacy and then so much of it has been on zoom but I've been watching um some really gorgeous productions on Zoom and some really inventive produ productions. I mean, I would say literally I've, p things have all been really different. It's kind of amazing that just like several rectangles on screen, people can do so much inventive stuff with them. But I would generally find that um, I've been really impressed. Like, I think that if I was like to give a piece of advice is that like actually the stakes are really high in the play. And so like the people who take it, like the, when the actors take it really seriously, it really kind of works. Um, and, and and kind of play against the comedy of it but um yeah I've just been really impressed by such like gorgeous performances and I, I really hope that it'll get to be realized in real life but also I've been really excited by what I've seen and very grateful so yeah um thanks um I'll shut up uh I'll pass on to Modja Sola yeah, thank you. Um, hope you can all see and hear me. Um, yeah, my name is Modri Sola Adebayo and uh, I wrote Windrush Generations and um, the, the kind of the grammar in there is, is part of a clue um, to ways into the production because it's, it's splitting the word wind and rush and there's generations, not generation at the end. Um, and perhaps that's, yeah, that's one of the clues into the, the play. Um, it was um, uh, informed, if not in, inspired, um, but it, yeah, very much informed by um, the the scandal that was the Windrush Generation scandal um, of a couple of years ago, um, where probably most of us remember, but um, uh, hundreds of people of African Caribbean um, descent elders um, were told by the British Home Office um, that they had to leave the country or didn't have the same kinds of uh, rights, um, even though um, they had lived there 
in Britain all their lives or most of their lives. And there were many, many um, really awful consequences. So I would like loads of us very, very moved by this, and very disturbed by it and, and cried actually. And I don't often cry at the news, um, but the thought of um, elderly people um, being thrown out of their homes and, and being forced to leave their country or the place that has become their country. Um, and so I, I knew that I wanted to write something um, about this at some stage. Uh, and then I started just doing some research because I was also kind of fascinated and drawn in by the name of the ship, um, the Empire Windrush, which I think is quite a poetic name, quite a beautiful name. And I was also kind of fascinated that even though um, the Empire Windrush wasn't the first um, ship to come um, from the Caribbean in the 50s to Britain, bringing people um, that to live and work in Britain. Um, it was a third ship, I think, around that time. Um, but it, it, it is the ship, maybe because of the number of people that were on the ship, but also I think there's something, and maybe that's just the writer in me, there's something about the name Empire Windrush that is kind of captivating of the imagination. It was certainly captivating my imagination. And I was interested one in why there's still for me such an attachment to the idea of empire and um, I currently um, stay in Berlin in Germany um, where as you can imagine absolutely appropriately um, there's massive shame um, about um, many of the things that have been done uh, in Germany and at the hands of, of German regimes like the Nazis and there's huge shame and a great seriousness um, with which people talk about Germany's history. But yet, as a British person, I've always been kind of curious as to why um, there isn't the same kind of um, levels of kind of shame or um, why the idea of empire still doesn't disconcert people. And um, when for me, as a person of African heritage, um, empire for me is associated with genocide. Um, which means people killing in various different ways, whether it be the killing of a culture or the killing of literal people or, you know, um, so I was kind of, you know, always kind of interested, why, why is there, why is it such considered almost a beautiful thing, empire? Why, why are people really ready to take the name empire after their names? And um, what's that about? And, but I was also equally interested in, in, in Windrush and thinking, where does this name come from? And, um, it's so evocative and I'm kind of interested in nature and climate change and, and um, our relationship with the weather. I'm really interested in all those things. So I just started doing a little bit of research on the name Empire Windrush. And what I discovered, um, without too much digging actually, is that the Empire Windrush um, uh, had another name and um, was renamed um, when it came under the hands of the British and was originally birthed in Hamburg in Germany in the 30s, late 20s, 30s, I should know that, which exact, which exact dates. It was a German ship and it was called the Monte Rosa. And it was used in tourism, early kind of European tourism um, by German kind of passengers. And then um, the Nazis came to power uh, in Germany and um, the ship was then taken and used um, uh, in the Holocaust. So it was used to transport um, Jewish uh, children, um, and, and, and elders um, uh, from Norway. Um, so it was used as a, as a ship during the Holocaust, the Monte Rosa. And then when uh, the Nazis lost the war and the Brit British claimed the ship, the ship that was then renamed Empire Windrush. And then I thought, wow, okay, so there's a bit of a ghost story, a kind of forgotten story. And I'm interested in forgotten stories, uh, hidden stories, hidden histories, um, the things that are left at the edge of the page. And I thought, OK, so s supposing and, and, and ships, as you all know, are, are referred to as she. And there's lots of reasons for that, superstitious reasons for that. But ships are often kind of um, given the kind of status of a person and as a, of a woman. So I thought, OK, let me embrace that and let's... Um, uh, imagine that um, the ship, the Monte Rosa, um, uh, who has been renamed Windrush, might have a little bit of a problem with her name having been changed. And so this became the kind of centerpiece of the story um, that there is, a, I imagine that this ship is a real uh, woman. And then I thought, okay, um, well, if, if it's got a kind of resonance of a ghost about it, and because she is, she, she is um, at the bottom of the sea right now, um, supposing there are some young people that are trying to seek out 
um, this ghost. And I, I maybe shouldn't say too much more, otherwise I'd give everything away. But so there are basically, the premises. there are a group of young people who are um, seeking out a ghost and um, they discover eventually that this ghost is uh, the ghost of the Empire Windrush, the ghost Monterosa. Um, and there are young people and they are in a university and I try and connect um, education and the history of universities and how universities have been used and a lot of hidden histories around universities and money that's come from establishing universities. And I work in universities, so I was kind of interested in that. So it's a group of young people um, in a university in their, in their first year and they're trying to seek out a ghost. Um, but this ghost wants to play a game this ghost is very playful and um, they are playing with their name and so the young people basically have got to figure out who this ghost is who this and they don't realize it's a ship who this woman is uh, and she gives them lots of clues through a Ouija board she gives them lots of clues and these clues are very playful and these clues um, each of these clues that this, this woman gives through this Ouija board um, spin off into scenes that are thematically connected with ideas of, of, of British identity and race and all these things, but they spin off into, into different scenes. Um, so, so this kind of centrepiece is this ghost story with lots and lots of scenes that spin off and kind of tell lots of different aspects of, of our histories in, in Britain and these particular islands that we live in. Um, so, and each of those scenes has a different kind of style um, because like a lot of my fellow writers, I really have worked a lot in youth theatre and I was really interested in, I think youth theatre is amazing because like Alison said, you get to have massive casts if you want them or small casts. I, as a youth theatre director, um, I always notice that often you'll get people who love movement. Um, so I wanted to write stuff where there was lots of space for movement. Um, often you get people who hate movement, who just want to talk and be really still and sit, and are, but are really good at learning lines. So I wrote, I wrote uh, scenes for people who might just want to sit and talk. Um, I often notice in youth theatres, not to get too stereotypical, but there are often very, very, not to gender this too much, but really, really committed young women who learn all their lines, who always show up um, and who actually want big parts, you know, and want, want, want to actually really go for it. So I, I wrote um, the Monte Rosa character for lots and lots of women or play, people playing women could play, imagining that there are certain people who really, really just want lovely, chunky monologues. So I tried to write stuff in there for all kinds of different um, performers and also all kinds of different youth theater directors and teachers um, for those who want to play th their strength is in movement or, or in spoken word poetry or in music. So there's lots and lots of different styles of work going on in those kind of spin-off um, scenes. Um, um, like my fellow writers, I haven't seen um, work in the flesh, um, or at least I've seen th work through the, through the screen, but um, I've been totally inspired. What seems to work with Windrush is when, um, when the makers, teachers, directors, performers, etc., are really brave and don't shy off the issues of, of race. Um, what's been really exciting is that I've seen people um, produce Windrush Generations in either um, mostly uh, groups who are all um, young people who present at least as white um, or might have one or two um, um, black and or Asian young people or mixed heritage young people or really, really diverse groups. So it's been really, really inspiring, for example, to see a group of all white young people in Wales going for it with, a, with rage and with passion and um, um, addressing the issues and not shying away from the issues and embracing the idea that all of that what happened in terms of the Windrush generation scandal is a scandal that affects um, all of us who live on these islands whatever our cultural heritage whatever the color of our skin um, so yeah so um, that's been really really exciting it's been really exciting to see some real really fantastic movement it's been really exciting to hear some very very fast very dynamic spoken word poetry um, yeah, and it's been a pleasure to be part of it. So um, I hope you get something out of reading it. And I'll pass to Chris. Thank you, Modjasola. 
it's, the whole thing has made me fall in love with connections again and again. Can you hear me all right? Can everyone hear me? Yes. Um, thank you for the opportunity to be here. My name's Chris. I wrote uh, Dungeness. Um, I feel really lucky because I've seen Dungeness live because this is the second year it's been put in the, the portfolio. And, uh, you know, the, the, I've seen it several, several times and uh, uh, by lots of different groups. So I, I, it's, uh, I really hope you'll get to see your plays live in the flesh and definitely seek them out when they, when they go. Um, so uh, Dungeness is about a group of LGBT plus young people who have been kicked out of their homes by their families or their 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 domestic circumstances uh, and they're living in this uh, kind of safe house of semi-independent um, place in Dungeness on the edge of England in England's only desert uh, and the play is in real time um, and it is fundamentally about a group of people who are deciding how they're going to commemorate um, uh, a two minute silence because there was a shooting of LGBT people uh, in a country far away. So for me at that time, it was the Orlando nightclub shootings, but it can be it could be anything. And there's a dis disagreement in the group about uh, do they go outside and protest? Do they show who you are? What if you're not ready to show the world who you really are? Um, how can you put what's the difference between protest and commemoration? Um, it's also about who does the washing up. Um, and so they have this kind of like 40 minute conversation where all their stories come to life. Uh, and then the play culminates with that two minute silence where we break the fourth wall and we all, um, uh, I can't really say it without crying because I'm an old wet tea towel, <laughs> but we all join in unity and have this two minute silence and remember who we, we've lost. Uh, and then the play comes on to be a massive um, pride march. So they hear this noise outside. They think it's people going to come beat down the door and uh, do them in. But actually, it's the local community getting together for a pride march. So um, that's the kind of arc of it. I wrote it because I wanted to see what I really felt I needed to see in school. Uh, I was born the year Thatcher came to power, so her of Section 28, um, queer people in, in this group now, uh, will just remember the, the erasure and the fear, and so I never knew gay people existed. Um, uh, so I would have loved to have just seen people like me that fall in love in the way that I do uh, at school. I think I would have felt a bit safer, and I think I would have might have had a bit of a happier time to be truthful. And I wanted to put that in schools and I wanted to do it in a really joyful way. So the play has a lot of humour in it uh, and it's quite silly. Uh, and it's just, you know, uh, you know, for all the seriousness, it's it's got that that kind of twinkle in its eye. Um, so it's been performed by it's I think it's had like 50 runs now because it's just it, I've, you know been it's been going for two two and a bit years and there's been productions outside of connections it's been done by an all-muslim girls school in Barking it's been done by a group in the Shetlands Islands and and what's really interesting is hearing people sometimes there's a group of teach there's a teachers who have got a group of really out and loud queer kids that want the story to say here we are other times there's schools saying do you know we've got a problem with homophobia here and we need this tool to address it um but what we have now is this amazing dungeness community where i'm always in touch with people and i forget i wrote this play like i just have this wonderful joyous beautiful thing in my life that brings me joy and uh, I forget that I had anything to do with it. It just is here. And, you know, I'll get messages from my mum saying my daughter came out or um, kids in school say, you know, I, I, this was a really good thing for me. So it, it's just been this really like selfishly amazing thing for me. <laughs> it's, it's been really good. Um, so that that's it, really. Um, I would say, um, like, I, I think we still do need the play. Like if you look at outcomes for LGBT kids, even though like some schools do an amazing job, you know, if you look at homelessness, if you look at um, uh, uh, suicide, self-harm, LGBT plus young people are overrepresented in, the, in those groups. So there is still really a huge gap between kind of how we might live in, uh, may, I, may I be bold to suggest like a more liberal bubble and, and what our what we think is you know there's this legislative world that we live in but then there is also the real world so I was a social worker before I became a writer and uh, the last thing I did as a social worker was teach sex education in schools um, and it, the, the homophobia 
you would hear in the majority of schools, truthfully, you know, so it's still there. So I think it is, you know, I think there's a lot of work to do. And Dungeness uh, just brings the opportunity to kind of plonk a play down. Just having the play in your library is really important. If you're going to do it, I would say don't shy away from the humour, really enjoy it. Think about pacing. I think I've written the most inflexible play. Like, I'm just thinking, wow, if one did this amazing job of like doing it for a cast of 50 or two. <laughs> I didn't do that. I'm really sorry. But you can have a big choir at the end, big choir for the for the Pride March. Um, I would really think about character and story. And the best productions for me, truthfully, are the ones without bells and whistles. So the ones without directorial flourishes, the ones that are kind of quite naturalistic. This is a group of people in a room and they're just really focused on. I've written each character kind of has an aria. They'll come forward and give like a monologue. Um, so if you really think about the pacing, just get your head around the pacing of the of that kind of 45 minutes. Um, they're, they're the best ones. The ones where people have done flourishes at the beginning of end, at the end, just tr truthfully, it doesn't work. It, it, it doesn't work. So, um, so yeah, the play has been a total joy and I love hearing anyone that's in it. So join the community, hashtag Dungeness, because we're always chatting. Um, and it's a really lovely thing to, to, to be part of. And, I, you know, I love hearing it as well. And a percentage of all sales of Dungeness go to Stonewall Housing, which is an LV, LGBT uh, homeless charity. So I donate some of the, pro the proceeds from the productions and then the publishers donate some money from the sales of the text as well. So the whole thing is just been tied into this beautiful thing of which I'm very grateful to, to be a part of. Is there anyone else I hand, hand over to? I think that's it. I think, is that everyone? Oh, Claire. Oh, got Claire. Claire. <laughs> Claire, yes, sorry. Claire, I apologise. <laughs> That's all right. Thanks, Chris. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Claire Proctor. I'm creative producer at the Belgrade Theatre in Coventry and one of three theatre makers alongside Justine Taman and Liz Mitten that worked alongside a group of 12 Coventry based young people to create our play Like There's No Tomorrow. Um, the piece is a response to what is arguably the most urgent and defining crisis of our time, that of climate change. Um, unfortunately, you don't have to look very far at the moment in the news to see that it's full of stories about wildfires in Greece, France, USA. Um, and the drive to tell this story um, came from uh, the young people themselves, who are all members of Belgrade youth theatre groups. Um, the play explores the impact of our failure as human beings to live well with the natural world and the global crisis that comes as and explores the global crisis that comes as a consequence. Um, I guess it encourages us to understand the urgent need for global thinking and systematic change and to consider how we can all contribute to this. Um, I think what's also important to say here is that Like There's No Tomorrow was, of course, created through a collaborative process of discussion, research and improvisation and is, as a result, a real reflection of young people's thoughts and ideas about the crisis the world finds itself in. Uh, so hopefully we'll speak to your young people as well. Um, in terms of premise, the world of the story is one in which um, distant lands are being plagued by the appearance of mysterious cracks, cracks which are creating wastelands and new waves of climate refugees. And Maru, who is the young person at the centre of our story, uh, lives in a city that so far is unaffected and largely unaware of this crisis. It's a place of economic growth and expansion, a city fueled by the promise of better and more. Uh, Maro is living with severe asthma, which is affected by air pollution and is finding themselves increasingly driven indoors, discovering hope and solace in the pages of a storybook. Uh, until one evening, following an asthma attack and the disappearance of the beloved book, a crack appears in Maru's bedroom, which starts to spread across the entire city and forces the community into the heart of the problem. Now, I should probably say here that I'm using the pronoun they, as all of the characters in the play are non-gender specific. Um, in terms of engaging with this story, I think it offers a lot 
to explore and unpack with groups of young people, whether that's in the classroom or, or rehearsal room context. Of course, first and foremost uh, is climate change in the environment. This is a, a complex social, moral and scientific issue. And we can't assume that each member of our groups feels the same way about it or that it feels equally important or relevant to all. Um, there may be other issues that feel more present for some of your young people. So it may help when working on the play to start here. You know, how are different parts of the world experiencing climate change? What are the behaviors, both individual and societal, that are contributing? What are the links between climate change and injustice and so on? Um, Youth voice and activism are also central to the play and there's an opportunity to explore with your learners their own feelings about the world and what they'd like to change about it and the tools that they might use. Uh, and there's also an opportunity to look at language and the power of language to persuade and sometimes coerce. There's a character of a local politician in the play that uses rhetoric to build support for their agenda, which in some parts blinds Maru's parents to the fact that there's even a problem. And uh, of course, stories and storytelling is another strand which feels incredibly rich territory, specifically the power of stories to help us make sense of our world and to begin to imagine it differently. Now, like lots of others, I haven't had the opportunity to see uh, our piece in person. I have seen a couple of versions online, um, all brilliantly done and, and based off viewing those, uh, just reflecting on some of the things that were done extraordinarily well uh, and to offer some advice to anyone thinking of taking our play on. Um, part of our story is located in Zimbabwe. Uh, in the play's prologue, we meet a community performing a ritual libation, giving thanks to the earth. And then later we're introduced to the character of Asha, who's a young person from that community, who's been living with the very real and very present impact of climate change. One of the territories the play, play focuses on is the relationship between capitalism and environmental decline, with a particular focus on the tension between the West and the developing world. Now, we chose Zimbabwe as an area of focus, as some of our young company members have a personal connection uh, with the country. However, uh, as Alison and Miriam have both spoken about, there is flexibility in our play too. There's flexibility in this. And you may choose another country in place of Zimbabwe and amend elements of the text accordingly. And we would invite any group working on the play to think about whether you want to explore for yourselves where else this tension exists. Where is climate change happening in your city, in our country, in our world? What are the countries are your group aware of that are being impacted by our choices? Uh, what rituals or traditions does that country have that are connected with the natural world? And I'll share one example uh, that became quite formative in the development process for us, uh, which was a news story we came across about a, a community in Iceland that staged a funeral to mark the loss of a glacier, um, which it was incredibly moving actually. And, and one of the things that we did was to look at recreating that moment for ourselves. Uh, our young people also discovered in their research that uh, significant amounts of UK plastic recycling is still being sent abroad, exported abroad, and having, of course, a significant impact on the country's disposing of it. So I think the thing to underline here is that the play presents an opportunity for you to work with your young people to support them to locate the crisis for themselves. Uh, the second piece of advice I'd offer is around scene transitions, and I know this got mentioned a couple of times already from others, but again, we have a lot, it's a very pacey play and a lot of transitions, and I think it's important to highlight that they're described in the text in some detail, and the reason for this is because we see them very much scenes between scenes. They have a narrative function in the play, they support the audience to understand the city and what happens to the city and the people in it once the crack appears. Um, they also present an opportunity that I think is really important to build an ensemble and to develop the theatrical language of the play. I'm going to stop talking now. The just final thing I'd like to say is that 
collaboration was absolutely at the heart of making this play. And I, there's an opportunity for you to make collaboration central to the process of staging it. Um, as a company, we gave ourselves the space to be playful, to experiment, to test and discard, um, to make, to challenge. And I think this is equally useful when thinking about staging the play and particularly when addressing the creative challenge presented by manifesting the crack. So you're not the only one, Chris, providing uh, lots of difficult uh, elements of plays for people to work with. Wow, I think this event could go on for a few hours. I was just like, <laughs> there's still so much I want to ask and hear from you all. I've just been like, wow, I want to, I want to go and read them all. Um, thank you so much. And we've had a few questions in. I don't know, we're probably not going to have enough time to go through every single one and ask you all. But um, I think I was just intrigued as well as hearing you all speak about what comes first in terms of does the play idea come first and then you mould it into a play for young people? Or do you think about the fact that you have to put on a play or write a play for young people and then you think about the issues that you want them to explore in schools? I don't know whether anyone wants to take that answer or, or whether they felt like that when they were when they were writing the play. Or whether there were any challenges you thought you had to overcome when you were writing for, for young people, aside from um, the language, obviously. <laughs> Does anyone want to take on the question? Be brave. <laughs> I could have a go, yeah. I, um, um, for me, I think um, the the issue uh, in terms of the um, racism and in, in Britain um, probably maybe even resonates a little bit with what Claire was talking about. That it doesn't like for me. It doesn't have to be. There aren't young people's issues and, and adult issues necessarily for me. Um, and um, I've often found in working with young people that they're much more open to working with really, really challenging um, issues um, than sometimes some adults and adult producers um, or older producers. Um, uh, Challenge-wise, for me, it's just it was just massively exciting to think of writing something potentially for a much um, bigger cast or a much smaller cast. And um, uh, knowing that um, if people are, young people are not being paid to perform, um, I was quite mindful that even more so that there must be, that there must be lots and lots of pleasure in the playing and lots and lots of opportunity um for um young people to um uh to get get them get really stuck into something that really excites them so i was thinking of a young person that might be really into spoken word or might be really into movement and giving them an opportunity and i can't remember who said um i, I could see your face but i can't remember your name who said i think it was miriam <laughs> who's saying about making sure that everybody had a really great line and I really resonate with that, making sure that everybody has something that is really, you know, really pleasurable and powerful to be playing with. Um, yeah, that was my take on that question. Great, thank you so much. I had a question in about um, how we engage students when first approaching a play. Do we, are there any techniques that you've had when you've been sitting down with students and bring a play first in? Do you talk about the subject? Do you read through the play all together? Do you ask them about how they would like to perform? Do you, are there any techniques that you've had when you've initially brought your play to some students? Or how do you engage them, I suppose, is the question I think someone's asking. Chris, go on, you can do it. I know that you've 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 encountered lots of uh, students in reading your play for the first time. <laughs> well, I was just thinking I'd be the worst person to answer this because I've never like done any youth theatre, um, uh, so I've never I've never worked uh, like I've never sat down with a group of a group of kids going through the play. To be totally honest, I've just had the pleasure of watching the the performance. So 
any other questions I could answer, I'd be really happy to, but I'm not <laughs> sure I could, I could, I think there'll be someone with much more experience in this group that'd be able to answer that. Yeah, Claire, what about you? With your brief as students. Yeah, my name's Claire. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have any... <laughs> When you, when you bring a play to your group of students for the first time, what, what is the first thing that will engage them? Um, I, I guess we always start with where they are in relation to it. So one of the very early questions I would always ask is what strikes you? What questions do you have about this? What strikes you about it? And kind of capturing that kind of early engagement with the text what are their initial impressions what has stayed with them what are they unsure about what does the play offer that they don't currently have answers in terms of questions that they don't currently have answers to and it might be that those are very deliberate big questions offered by the play that we might not find easy immediate responses to but they're what challenges for us in the staging that we ourselves have to think about when um, presenting the play for an audience so that's that's usually the point where I would start. I mean, in terms of our own play, we started from um, the conceptual, I suppose. We started from um, crisis and um, change and unpacked those two ideas um, for the young people in the group. Um, what did they mean? What did they look like? Um, what do they understand of those ideas so that we might work together to understand, are we in a period of change or are we in a period of crisis or can it be both? And we did a lot of um, very um, on its feet physical work. So lots of making depictions, um, you know, in, there's a real power in creating and then unpacking images together, you know, asking the question, what do you see of each other? It can be really profound. Uh, giving names to images, um, again, so that we can kind of really drill down to the essence of something. Those are just initial thoughts. I hope they're helping whoever asked the question. No, there's some really great thoughts. Thank you, Claire. Um, the other question I had in about was inspiring young people to choose drama at GCSE and A-level. And I think this is kind of more of a wider question about why we should encourage young people to study drama or in any aspect, it doesn't have to be at GCSE or A-level, it could be outside of school in, in a theatre group. But I don't know whether anybody had any thoughts about, or a five minute, not even a five minute, five second pitch about why study drama and nothing else? Why go for the arts and not the sciences? Oh, okay. um, <laughs> Hiya, sorry. For, for me, it's about empathy. That it, empathy is such a the world would be a better place if we were all good at using our sort of um you know our, our empathy muscle um and I think that's I think that is the muscle that we're working as playwrights and actors and and directors and production teams we're we're putting ourselves in other shoes I love um Mojisola's uh tale of the of the you know identifiably white all white cast just passionately giving that story and and um and you know that's what I tried to do in Crusaders that that these young people had were suddenly in the in the place of those kids in their cages away from their parents or or the young bride trying to make the best of this sort of too much responsibility too young so I th for me my pitch uh would be uh, that the world would be a better place if we were all more empathetic and and drama is a, a great shorthand for that. Fabulous, thank you Francis. I'm going to hand over to Kirsten for the final words because um, I know it's four o'clock and, um, and I'm going to run out but I don't know whether you wanted to say anything about connections Kirsten at this point or whether what you know how a connections play differs from a, a normal national theatre kind of play. I mean, in terms of the commissioning process, one thing Francis mentioned is um, about doing workshops during the writing process with young people. And that's something that happens in all connections plays. So either as part of the writer's research or sort of during their writing process, um, all the plays get the chance to be kind of workshopped with groups of young people, which is a really important part of the process for us. And um, yeah, really key to their success, I think. And, you know, young people are brilliantly honest about what they 
what they feel about the plays in all the ways that they should be. Um, and I think another difference about the connections plays is that, you know, if you write a new play for a theatre, often then that's a process that you'll be involved with all the way through. You know, you'll be in the rehearsal room, you'll be there at previews, you'll be making changes right up till press night. And actually with the kind of beautiful thing about the connections plays is that the writers write something and then they they kind of give it away. They go, you know, this is now yours to do something with. And I think there's a real generosity in that in terms of being really excited by the possibility of, you know, 20 or 30 groups having completely different approaches and um, some of which might be what you have in your head and some are something totally different and really celebrating and enjoying that. And I think um, that the wonder there's a kind of wonderful lack of ego about that and I, I do remember one of our connections writers saying it's not really about me it's about it's actually about the young people and um I think that's yeah what makes the play so brilliant and I have to say you know I know all the plays the writers were, we're talking about really well but hearing you guys talk about them I was like oh that sounds good gosh aren't they all brilliant um so yeah I found that very um yeah just really really inspiring guys so thank you so much it was really wonderful to hear you all talk about them um, and then also just say um, at the moment uh, applications for Connections 2022 are now open so um, have a look on the Nationals website if any of you are from groups who might be interested in taking part um, and yeah all the information is there. Fabulous and I just wanted to end it by again thanking you all and, and I sometimes feel that just hearing from you all passionately and how enthusiastic you are or, you know about your plays it just it brings that out and I think it's it's great. Um, so thank you so much for taking the time out to come and talk about your plays. Um, they're all published by Metha and Jama, um, all out now, This, which is why we're doing this today, to celebrate the anthology. So um, thank you. Thank you so much. And I'm going to end there. Have a great evening, everybody. Thanks. Hello. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.